We talk about faithfulness today. Actually, it. I was thinking here as we were as we talked about the offering today was about women's ministry. We had three ladies that were here as our guests from another church came and uh, sacrificed their chance to be worshiping with their family to be here and to be singing with for us up here, and we appreciate that very much. And it was as I saw them up there on the front, it reminded me in. Um, a church about 15 years ago, I had be called to be the, the pastor there, and we got into a discussion about redoing the front of the church, redecorating the inside of the church. And when we did, we actually made a statement, a philosophical statement about worship. Because, you see, that church was all designed where the pulpit sat kind of up. It was, it was up and very prominent. And uh, then just below that, there was another section before you get to the main floor, where there was this other section that had another uh, other opportunity for a sort of a mini pulpit, and it was uh, you know had a place for people to be able to be at. What it amounted to was Sabbath school happened from there. Only the ordained could be up here at the big pulpit, and the other one uh, on this lower level situation. And it was kind of a moat in between, where you're you know from, if you're up there preaching from the front. It was a long way to get to the people because there's this other section here. But really, that was there for a theological reason. We didn't have people; only the ordained could be up here. And that meant, for instance, if you were going to have a woman that was in charge of the Sabbath school, if she was talking in Sabbath school, that had to happen down below. You see where I'm going with this. And so when we talked about, all right, let's redo, we made the whole platform being one that was more usable, brought it out, put it all on the same level, kind of very much like we have here. And so everybody could be on the same level. We had actually changed the theology of worship. And it worked. And there was some discussion and some pain in the process because that was a different way of thinking. Okay? Today we're going to talk about women in the church. Now, please understand, in talking about women in the church, I am only talking about it in the context of what we talked about last week. Last week we ordained new deacons and elders. Had a neat ordination service gathering of the whole church together, talking about leadership, talking about working together. But notice, if you will, the texts that talk about ordination, uh, organization of ordaining people to leadership within the church are really 1 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 3 and uh, the book of Titus. So those are really the ones we focused on 1 Timothy. And if you're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, a funny thing, but 2 comes before 3. And it only has six chapters in the whole book, and there's chapter 5 there as well, that both talk about the issue of women in the church. How does that fit? What is that doing there? And I would suggest there's something that leads us an opportunity to talk about and to think about. Now, please understand, folks, I am not the least bit interested in getting myself into a controversial situation. That's kind of, there's some controversy within different circles in the Adventist church about ordination of women or not. And uh, probably when, if, we, if this goes successfully, I will probably have the ones that are pro-women in the church be, uh, uh, ordination in the church mad at me. And I will probably have the ones that are anti-women ordination in the church mad at me. So uh, I'm glad there's no tomatoes here today, all right? But my issue is not even about that. I am a small pastor in a medium-sized church. Far be it from me to be the, the arbiter or the decision maker on any of this kind of stuff. My issue is, can we have a discussion from the Scriptures? Can we do that? Can we take the Scriptures, look at the Scriptures, including the Scriptures that we might say, what's that doing in there? Why is that there? And can we look at the Scriptures together in a way that can, where we can have a sane conversation, the context of which talks about what is God like, what is God saying, and what is God's plan and purpose for His people? Does that make sense? The texts on women in the church. 1 Timothy, chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Those are your main ones that get into the real controversial stuff of, whoa, what about women in the church? Can we back up a little bit and suggest at the beginning, does the scripture say that to the people of God's people in the church that they have spiritual gifts? Does God say that? And when he says he gives that to the people of the church, does he mean only the males? Do spiritual gifts apply to men and women? All right? And are both supposed to use those spiritual gifts to God's glory and honor? 
Oh, of course. All right. So we've got that straight before we go any further. But again, my issue is not the issue of arbitrating, the issue of where women stand in the church. My issue is, can we have a discussion about Scripture? So it's about looking at the Scriptures that's really my issue. Let's start over here. I'm out of context, and I know that. Come now, let us reason together. And I would suggest God intends us to be reasonable and to think reasonably and to be respectful and reasonable with one another as we talk and as we pray and we discuss things together. Does that make sense? So I would suggest whatever we're going to talk about, and again, I'm not the arbiter, I'm not here to change your mind or to move your mind or whatever. My issue is, what about the text? Can we look at the text and can we have something that shares with us something about God's plan and purpose for us? Does that make sense? All right? Come now, let us reason together. Let's reason together. A little ditty. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible, this my only question be, the teachings of men so often mislead us, what says the Bible to me? Do you believe that? I like that. What says the Bible? That's, I, I like that. Do you like that? Do you like the idea? The Bible should be the ones that should determine what we believe and what we don't, right? What does the Bible say? That's the issue, right? That isn't what the author was saying. Watch this. This is what we're saying. Put the emphasis there. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible? This my only question be. The teachings of men so often mislead us. But what counts is what says the Bible? Emphasis. What says the Bible to me? Right? Here's what the author is meaning when they said it. Okay. Ah, there we go. See the difference? Where do you put the emphasis? The author was the, of the little ditty is saying, what says the Bible to me? I'm the one that it puts. Now, which are you more comfortable with? The Bible says it, and that says, settles it for me. You comfortable with that? Or are you comfortable with this? Well, what does the Bible say to me? Before you get to, I'm going to tell you that in my mind it's a trick question. The answer is really, frankly, in my mind, someplace in between. If you're going to say, oh, the Bible says it, and I've got a text, and that's the end of the discussion, I would say be very, very, very careful. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16 basically is a verse, and I've seen this in the literature. It says, Colossians chapter 2, 16, don't let anybody judge you in food or in drink or in Sabbaths. And they will say, that text right there says that text finishes it for the Sabbath. Don't let anybody judge you on the subject of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is fini, according to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. And we Sabbath keepers would say, wait a minute here. You've got to look at the text in the totality of Scripture. You can't just grab a verse and say, this settles it. Be very careful about, I've got a text and that's it. I grew up in the 50 text rule. I'm always talking about it in our Wednesday night Bible study. You've got to have a bunch of texts so that you can line them up well like, like fence posts. The more text you have on a topic, the more you can be pretty confident that you've got straight what the Scripture is trying to say. Where you have very few texts, be much more careful about how dogmatic you get, regardless what the subject. Folks, when it comes down to it, this business of women in the church, you better be careful about your, your text issues because there aren't that many. But the other question is, how do we look at the text? I'm going to be really Adventisty here. I'm going to rattle some things off to you that are really, really, really Adventisty for a minute as an illustration of this, okay? Now, please understand where I'm coming from. Seventh-day Adventist in its earliest time period was believed in Bible and Bible alone for Scripture, but Seventh-day Adventists within its leadership, the people got together, prayed together, struggled together about how to sorting out this issue of what God was leading and believing. One of the leaders in that group, we believe, had the gift of prophecy that God gave. And in fact, the lady, yes, it was a lady that had this gift of prophecy that God was working with. So I want to show you something that's very Adventisty about how do we interpret what we're looking at, okay? Watch this. This one gets a little bit long. I've got to see if I can get this thing to work for me here. The issue is not about women in the church. It's about a different subject completely. What age should children be to go to church? And there were people that are saying, we have a quote from Ellen White, the prophet, that says a kid should not go to school until age 10. And this is in, the, in discussion in relation to that, okay? For years, much instruction has been given me in regards to the importance of maintaining firm discipline in the home. I have tried to write out this instruction and to give it to others. 
Those who assume the responsibilities of parenthood should first consider whether they will be able to surround their children with proper influences. The home is both a family church and a family school. The atmosphere of the home should be so spiritual that all the members of the family, parents and children, will be blessed and strengthened by their association with one another. Heavenly influences are educational. Those who are surrounded by such influences are being prepared for entrance into the school above. Mothers should be able to instruct their little ones wisely during the early years of childhood. If every mother were capable of doing this and would take time to teach her children the lessons they should learn in early life, then all children should be kept in, could be kept in the home until their age of 8, 9, or 10 years of age. There's the principle. All right? Now, it seems that the question is that these children going to school, I want to know from the parents, every one of them, who it is that feels perfectly satisfied with their children as they are without sending them to schools, to a school that has Bible lessons, has order, has discipline, and is trying to find something for them to do and to occupy their time. I do not think there is anyone, if they come to understand it, who will, be, who will have objections. But when I heard what the objections were, that the children could not go to school till they were 10 years old, I wanted to to tell them that there was not a school, a Sabbath keeping school when the light was given me, that the children should not attend until they were 10 years old to be in, uh, uh, enough to be instructed. They should be taught at home to know what proper manners were they, and w when they went to school and not to let, be led astray. The wickedness carried on in the common schools is almost beyond conception. I better stop right there and fix that sentence. The Seventh-day Adventists have been strong on education for years. This, actually, this quote is from over 100 years ago. Adventists have been strong on Adventist Christian education to assimilate our beliefs with our education. She is not taking a shot at somebody else's school. She's saying it doesn't apply. We can't teach what we believe in the context of the ABCs and the 123s in some other school. And that's what she's talking about or objecting to here. We want a school where, the, where our young people can learn ABCs, 123s in the context of God and who he is and what he is. That's why we do schools. That is how it is and my mind has been greatly stirred in regard to this idea. Here comes her complaint. Why, Sister White has said so-and-so, and Sister White has said so-and-so, and therefore we are going right up to it. Her point is, these are people that are saying, can't have your kid in school until grade 10, age 10. Can't have your kid in school until age 10. Sister White says so, and that finishes it. I have a quote. And she's saying, come on, guys. Now watch this one. God wants us all to have common sense. He wants us to reason from common sense. Circumstances alter conditions. Circumstances change the relation of things. What she was saying is, ideally, in a perfect world, it'd be good to keep your home, your children home. But if mom isn't home, what are you supposed to do? So here's the ideal, but if we're not there, let's figure out what we're going to do along the way to get there. Does that make sense? I would say that's common sense. But notice, you got to interpret things based on common sense. Is that scary? That's what she's saying. Let's get even messier. This is a ad very Adventisty one. Again, over the issue, did Ellen White have the gift of prophecy? In 1846, remember the date, in 1846 I attended with my husband a meeting at Topsham, Maine at which Elder Joseph Bates was present. He did not then fully believe that my visions were of God. The meeting was a season of much interest. The Spirit of God rested upon me. I was wrapped in a vision of God's glory. For the first time had the view of other planets. After I came out of vision, I related what I had seen. Elder Bates then asked if I had studied astronomy. I told him I had no recollection of ever looking into any astronomy. He then said, this is of the Lord. His countenance shone with light from heaven and he exhorted the church with power. The issue was Bates was a sea captain and he had with his telescope been studying the astronomy. He was an amateur astro astronomer for his day. And what he had was Ellen White had a vision where God showed him the planets and the issue was about the Jupiter. How many moons on Jupiter? That was the question. And he answered, she told him how many uh, moons were on Jupiter. You want the problem? The astronomy was wrong. Today we know the astronomy was wrong. That is to say, how many moons on Jupiter since the 1900s when we've gotten more powerful uh, telescopes, we know that what they saw in 1886, there are more new moons than we thought there were in 1846. God gave the vision to the prophet not about 
answering how the question of astronomy, but about getting the attention of the guy that was curious, and he was an amateur astronomer, and God showed exactly what he understood in that time and place. If God would have given her the, the answer that we know today about how many moons are in Jupiter, she, he would have thought she was a nut and would have turned it off right there on the spot. Now here's the question. Can the prophet be wrong for a different purpose if something else going on? Now here's the next question. Can we interpret Scripture accordingly too? That's adventist stuff. Can we interpret Scripture that way? Does this process of interpretation apply to Scripture? John 5 and verses 2 and through 4. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool which is called Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. And the angel went down a certain time into the pool and stirred up the waters. Then whoever stepped in it first, after the stirring of the waters, was made well of any disease. Do you believe that? Desire of Ages. At certain seasons, the waters of this pool were agitated, and it was commonly believed that. See the difference? Which way do you believe? Read any commentator today, and they're basically going to tell you that was an understanding of that day. You know why the waters moved? The pool of Bethesda was actually two pools sitting right next to each other. Actually, they were cisterns. Jerusalem doesn't have a lot of water, or didn't in that day. It has to be piped in today. Cisterns were there to collect the rainwater. Bethesda was two pools sitting right next to each other. That's why five sides, there was something going down between them. And there was also a pipe between the two. Have you ever dumped, have you ever dumped milk over a gallon milk out of a junk jug? And it goes blub, 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 blub. Why? Because when you, you, the water has to have room, if there's room in the pipe for, an, for the air to flow to, it will flow racily. If the air gets cut off, it'll, it'll bubble and it'll jiggle. That's what was happening. It was an understanding belief, by the way. Tell me about your God who has the system rigged so that somebody who climbs over a bunch of other people to get in the water first can be the first one to, to be, is the one that gets healed. You comfortable with that one? It was a commonly held belief. The story, John doesn't tell it to argue about whether the issue of how the pipe was. He tells the story to get to the fact that Jesus healed a man that couldn't get in the water and couldn't be healed. Jesus healed somebody that was beyond any earthly hope of healed. That was the story. Do we need to get tangled up in? Was it literally? Now, folks, you ever heard of the Thomas Jefferson Bible? Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States, and Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He believed in Scripture. He quoted Scripture all the time. He didn't believe in miracles. The Thomas Jefferson Bible is the Bible, King, regular King James Version of the Bible, cutting out all the miracles. So in other words, he didn't believe there was a virgin birth. He didn't believe there was a resurrection. He didn't believe in any of those things because those are, those are not humanly possible. So that's not... I'm not talking about throwing out the Bible and being a Thomas Jefferson Bible, but I am saying, can we look at the culture of the time and the place, and can we look at the culture and say, this is the way things were understood in the context of what's being said? Can we do that in interpreting Scripture? Can we look at things that way? Am I making you uncomfortable yet? What about a comma? Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Assuredly, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. Where you put the comma is interpretation, folks. It says everything about what you believe about what your God is like. It says everything about what you believe about hell. It says everything about what you believe about life after death. Where you put the comma is translation, folks. It is interpretation. Does that make sense? Can we handle that? You have to do some interpreting. Is that fair? Now, let's not go so far as it doesn't matter until it's to me, and so Scripture is only if it's right to me but not to you and whatever, that's irrelevant. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not so far as only what the Scripture says to me. But I am saying you can't just grab a text and say, that text says it, God says it, and that settles it for me. God would have us to think to reason and to reason from cause to effect, to use common sense and to use it in the interpretation of our Bible, and that's how God guides our minds, I believe. Are you okay with that one? We okay there? What about slavery? 
There are many people today that don't know much about their Bible that go gaga when they look at their Bible and realize that Paul Philemon is a book where Paul sent a slave who became a Christian back to his master. A runaway slave who got his freedom by running away. When he became a Christian, Paul sent him back to his master. What? Did Paul believe slavery was a wonderful thing? No. But Jesus put it this way. Well, let me back up and see if I can get to it. John 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not of the world. Jesus did not come to this world so that he could straighten out all of the little pro each of our individual little problems. He came for something bigger than that. Jesus did not come to this world to get tangled up in all the details. The apostle Paul hated slavery. But if he'd have made slavery an issue of what he was discussing, the Christian church was barely getting off the ground. If they'd have made slavery part of the discussion, it would have turned off more people. And he was about something bigger than that. He was saying our God came to free people from the slavery of sin, not to free John from the slavery of Joe. Does that make sense? Take care of the bigger issue, the littler issue will take care of itself. Get sidetracked on all the little issues and we will miss the big issue completely. I've always learn from hunting. If you've got a rifle and you've got a bullet in it that can take down a bear and no bear is around, don't get sidetracked and go shooting at squirrels. Even if you would be lucky enough to hit the thing, you are not going to have anything to take home for lunch if that bullet hits a, bear, hits a squirrel. It's too much power for where you're at. Stay to the bigger issue. The issue we're talking about is how can we interpret scripture? Let's get to women in the church. By the way, 1 Corinthians 11, this one is about hair, actually. A woman and her hair, and a man and his hair. And I would say, boy, I remember when I was a kid in school, this was one we fought about big time. Funny, I don't fight about it anymore. It's rather irrelevant to me now, I'm afraid. I do the beehive thing to kind of keep everything covered, so I don't, I don't do the big hair like I did back then irrelevant now. Boy, I wanted to fight about it then. This is one of the toughest scriptures in all the world, 1 Corinthians 11, to try to deal with, unless you can accept a little bit of cultural background can answer a lot of questions. That was a cultural issue. And by the way, if you've seen our Mennonite friends, you know, with the ladies, Mennonite women will not cut their hair, and they put it up in a bun, you know, and, and I respect them great. They have, that's their way of dealing with this verse, and I would suggest they're as far off as the rest of us that cut our hair. The issue is about the veil and using it for covering. It is not talking about whether you... It, it's, it is totally... If you, if, you, if you want... The people that are still living to this the best today are our Islamic brothers and sisters. You're talking about veils and burqas and that kind of stuff, really what you're talking about. In other words, almost every Christian you look at is interpreting the verse in the context of the culture of the day and time. Understand the culture that Paul was working with. Why is he going to fight over the issue of what kind of, how people wear their hair? He was saying, stick to the culture you're in. Don't fight the culture that much. We're dealing with something much bigger than that. Is that fair? If you accept that cultural standpoint, 1 Corinthians 11 is easy to interpret. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Again, another one. If you can accept culture, 1 Timothy chapter 5 is very easy to deal with. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 2 through 16 is not talking about women. It's not talking about families. When it's talking about your widows, get your widows to the ones that below 60, have them get married and whatever. He is not talking about, about, about women or family in any way, shape, or form. He is talking about welfare. What do I mean? They didn't have a state welfare system. He's talking about how to take care of widows and orphans. How do you take care of widows and orphans? Read through 1, Corinthians, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 5. He is talking specifically about don't, there's only so much resources in the church, and the church needs to take care of the ones that really need it. If somebody has family that can take care of them, have them do it. He's talking, remember now, women couldn't get a job. It was within the family that you took care of. So if a lady was a widowed early, what happens to, how does she survive? If she's in the church, how does she survive? The church is to take care of her. We had, when I was a, when I was a boy, 
I remember on the farm where we lived, the neighboring farm, then there, there were these two brothers that farmed that farm. They had um, run that farm for years. As they were getting older, they handed the farm over to one of the kids. One of the brothers was married, one was not. Uh, and when, they, when the two brothers got old enough, they decided to retire. It was really weird. They got old enough to retire. That was it. They wouldn't help anymore. They turned the farm over to the next generation, and the next generation had to take care of them perfectly. They stayed on the farm. The bachelor lived in the house, and he'd every day, he would just sit at the kitchen table, and I saw it many times. He would sit at the kitchen table and just be playing solitary. He refused to do anything. He was past retirement age. He didn't have to do anything. He was perfectly, legitimately able-bodied, I retired. You've got to take care of me. Huh? I've seen that in the church, too. I remember, boy, I've seen it once. A gentleman that was a wonderful church deacon, he took care of everything. He was the first one here to get at the church to get everything opened up and the last one to close it down. He got everything clean. He was a handyman. He could take care of everything. And the church loved him so much, the church said, you know, I think we ought to make you an elder. And that week after he was adorned as an elder, he said, uh, -uh I'm not going to be there anymore in deacon, and no way are you going to get me to take up offering anymore. I am an elder. Some of you are scratching your, your head. I did too. Huh? What in the world is that? Paul's counsel is, if you're able to work, get a job. Don't be demanding everybody in the church to take care of you. That's what 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy chapter 5 is about. If there's a lady that's young, get married, get a family, get do what. Don't just decide to be like George in the farm. I get to sit here at the table playing solitaire and the rest of you have to take care of me. Don't do that. That's his context. But what do you do with this nasty one, the tough one? What about 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy chapter 2. Remember, it's in the context, chapter 3. 1 Timothy is all about leadership and organizing the church. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I exert, first of all, that all supplicants, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, when he said for all men, does he mean all people or does he mean all males? The word there used in Greek is anthro, as in anthropology. Is anthropology the study of males or is it the study of humans? It's humans. Does that make sense? Verse 8. Therefore I desire that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What's he mean there in verse 8? He's not talking about... He's not talking about a disco. He's not talking about praying with your hands flying around in the air. He's not talking about swinging the tambourines or swinging from the lampshades. He's talking about holy hands as in hands that are worthy to be able to be uplifted to God. The ones praying in public should have holy hands. Does that make sense? That's not that complicated. But here we go. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and modesty, not with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly clothing. Question, folks. In our culture today, does that apply to the men as much as the women? Our culture today, the women, the men kind of like to shine it up a little bit too, don't they? Is that only applying to the women? Or is the principle there, have people see their godly, what is godly within you rather than the thing that, is, that, 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 that you've got doing whatever, right? Now here again, I'm not here to argue about what you should wear or what you shouldn't, but I am saying the principle applies to the men as much as it does to the women. Does that make sense? It was very relevant and current in that day, women only. It was not an issue with the men, but when you've got a culture that does both, it apply, it's a principle, not a specific. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Can we interpret that? All right. But which is proper for, for women professing godliness good, with good works. Let a woman learn in silence. Woo! Got that one? Let them learn in line of silence. You'll get some big amens on that one, usually from one side of the church. <laughs> this one's actually pretty easy to deal with. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 also, where it says, I demand that the women not, not speak in public and that they, you know, stay quiet and they can ask their husbands in, in private. Well, it's pretty easy if you understand a little about culture. 
the culture of the day and time in worship. The men sat on one side, the ladies on the other. Pretty well understood that for the most part, men got education when did my own family, my father. My father was the fifth of six kids, and they, they were all boys except for one. The girl was the oldest. My Aunt Grace was the oldest in the family. Her dad would not allow her to get a high school education. Why did women need education? They could cook and clean. That was the thinking where he was at, and he was a little bit of a, well, she wasn't the only one he abused, but the point is, that was his thinking. After she got older and on her own had her kids, when her kids got older, she had her, got her education herself and was very proud of her high school education, and we were very proud of her. But that was the thinking. Now imagine, if you will, if you've got ladies on this side, men on that side, the ladies are not, are not allowed an education, and they're sitting there and something is such, and, and all of a sudden in the middle of the church, somebody says, Hey, Henry, what did he mean? And Henry feels he has to respond back. Well, he was talking about this. And now imagine if ten of us were doing that going on. You've got bedlam. And Paul is simply saying, Why don't you take those questions home? When you get home, talk about them there. Not that complicated. But it gets worse in 1 Timothy. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Yeah, there you go. And Adam was oh, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Self Question, folks. If you're going to take that literal... I've got a very dear friend of mine. They're very good friend, friends, family. They are a childless couple. They have shed many a tear over the fact that they are a childless couple. Does that mean she can't be saved? What about the lady who has never, for whatever reason, it hadn't worked out that she's found uh, Mr. Wright? Can she not be saved? What about the couple that decided, for whatever their own personal reasons, not to have children? Can they not be saved? Or she not be saved? He can. It's her that can't. Are you getting comfortable with this, or is something, is something off kilter here? Let's go back to the Old Testament. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, their wives were all having so much trouble having children, and remember that was their identity was in how many children they had. That was the thinking of the time. That was a woman's identity. Can a little help of understanding a little bit of the background of the time and place help us with understanding what's being said? Can we interpret it that way? Or are we better off to say, I got a text, and this says it. You see what I'm saying? Can we be a little bigger than that? And still be consistent with the Word of God and what God has for us? That was the culture. If Paul would have spoken up and said, women can have the same positions that men could, the Christian church would have been thought of as a scandal. Can we have a little room for culture coming into the interpretation? Can we do that? Have I shocked you too much? I'm not the least bit interested in settling the issue of ordination of women or not. That's not my issue. Can we agree that women have spiritual gifts and to use them as much as men? Can I take a shot at you with a theory? As I look at Scripture, it is my theory that women have been ordained in the Scriptures for a long time. In this sense, when Abraham was called to go and to be God's spokesman? Was Sarah called to, or was she an afterthought? When Abraham was called, Sarah was too. It was a team thing. It was a team gig. I would suggest in this church we have numerous women that are ordained because they have stood beside their husbands in ministry and, and leader and whatever the elders did. There is much doing it sometimes better than the men. But things have gotten complicated in the world in which we live. I can tell you in Adventist pastoral ministry, it used to be 
If a man's wife wasn't as committed as he was to ministry, he would never get a call or a job in pastoral ministry. It was just assumed they were both going to do it. I can tell you of days in education where literally if a husband and wife were both teachers, she would get paid less. And before you think that's so terribly unfair, it wasn't designed to be unfair. It's only been since I've been in pastoral ministry that they consider us being, us being pa paid a salary. Before that, it was always just a living wage. And the idea was you didn't need two living wages. We were all in, we were all in mission service together was the idea. And it's about what do you need to survive, not how much do you need. And, but it ended up getting polluted into women didn't get paid as much. That ain't fair, nor is it right. But the purpose originally was had nothing to do with that. But since we've gotten to the issue of everybody gets paid an honest salary, it's got to be the same, folks, because it's the same thing. And we are living in a day and age where there's divorce and, there's, and, women, and women have to have their own, their own careers, even two-career family, whether we agree with it or not. The circumstances of family approach to things have changed radically. Have I got you horrified yet? And my issue is not about women. My issue is, can we look at the Scripture even the scriptures that have us go, ooh, I don't like that one. Can we prayerfully get our Bible down together? Pray together, talk together, search together, struggle together for answers. And can we believe that God answers that kind of faith and openness? Can we do that? Can we have a sane conversation without yelling at each other? That's the question. Can we look at the Word of God and say, Bible, speak to us? But it's got to be interpreted through our minds so that we understand it or else it's just gobbledygook. Does that make sense? Can we do that? Can we open the scriptures together? Can we look at the subject of women in the church? And by the way, I would suggest if somebody's going to grab these verses that look kind of rough toward women and grab it and say, see, you woman, stay in your place, that's a guy using Bible or religion to abuse is that unfair to say it that way? We've got to look at things and have it make sense, and it's got to be consistent with all of Scripture, and it's got to be consistent about what God says and what God is like in his views toward people, personhood. Does that make sense? Come now, let us reason together. But in doing so, the issue is, Jesus, we see you and we want to be like you. I want to be like Jesus. I want to represent Jesus. I want Jesus shining out of me, male or female. Amen. Heavenly Father, may we love the God of the Bible and the Bible that shows us God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And may we grow and mature to be like Him. And may we learn together from our scriptures is our prayer in his name. Amen.